All right, so uh, we're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 19 through 39. And um, this is a particular passage that I think is a little bit difficult. Some passages are difficult because they take more time to understand. Some are difficult because they step on your toes. This one's probably more stepping on, on toes. Um, this is a passage that... Uh, will probably be very familiar to you that you've probably heard quoted many times before, uh, 24 and 25. Uh, it's my belief, however, that we don't fully understand uh, or at the very least maybe either misquote or misuse this verse uh, in a way that probably isn't intended by uh, the writer. So um, We'll probably spend the majority of the time looking at that uh, this morning, and then probably we will finish up chapter 10 next week is probably what's going to happen uh, and get into the rest of it. So uh, with that being said, um, I'll go ahead and read the, uh, the passage, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Um, again, this is coming from the ESV uh, version that I'm reading from, but whatever version you have, uh, Probably as long as it's not the message, it'll be, it'll be fine. Um, okay, so, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. <clears throat> for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer uh, remains a sacrifice for sin, but a, a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And so here is, um, starting really in 19, we have this transition of uh, really what sets the book of Hebrews apart from other books and the emphasis of Christ being our great high priest. And so there's this transition now of uh, focusing, I think, on one of the major issues that the brethren in Palestine are going through uh, uh, possibly, I think it's highly uh, uh, implied here that there is a wanting to turn back to Judaism because of possible persecution. And so basically up until this point, the evidence has been laid out um, uh, that Christ is superior to Judaism. And now we're probably getting into the heart of the matter. Um, don't give up on Christ. Don't give up on Christianity. Um, because of the things that you're suffering. There's nothing for you to go back to in Judaism. Christ 
is all that you have. And so there's this, there's this turning point now away from the focus of the evidences, I guess, if you want to call them, of, of Christ being superior to the old law, and focusing on probably what is the heart of the matter. And it's no coincidence that chapter 11 follows immediately after, uh, afterwards to really solidify um, these heroes and heroines of faith to further uh, try to cement, if you will, um, uh, um, the importance of having faith in God uh, and, and in Christ. And so uh, we've kind of moved past uh, the better than um, aspect of Hebrews, and now we're going to get into more of the nitty-gritty um, parts of the book. So this is... The Lord's invitation, 19 through 25. So through the blood of Jesus, all faithful and obedient followers of him may enter into the holiest, uh, that, that's meaning heaven. Um, the veil of the temple, metaphorically, is, is referred to as the body of Jesus. So as the body of Jesus died on the cross, the second veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the way to the Father was opened. Uh, we've discussed that uh, last week. Um, the description of the way to the Father is twofold. It's new in the sense of being recent or fresh, and it's also living because Jesus ever lives to make intercession for his people. So there's a threefold invitation from the Lord himself. And so the invitation hinges on the Christian's boldness or courage to act and to obey. And so there's three... Um, let us statements uh, for the Christian. Let us draw near in worship and prayer. Let us hold fast our confession, that is, our, our confession of Jesus. And let us consider one another in worship. Um, and so these, uh, these are the invitations from the Lord himself for, for the Christian. And so uh, what are the conditions for drawing near to God or God drawing near to his people. Number one is having a pure heart. Number two is full assurance of faith. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's a heart cleansed or purged from an evil conscience. And number four, it's a body washed with pure water that's referring to, to baptism. And there's a bunch of associated verses there for you to look at uh, on your, whenever you have time. Um, and so I think one important thing to, uh, to note is that faith is synonymous with hope. And that's going to be very evident when we get into chapter 11 and verse 1. And so we'll take a look at that closer and in more detail when we get there. And so instead of looking backwards, uh, the writer encourages uh, his listeners to look forward to the coming of the Lord. Um, and so the question becomes, will these Hebrew Christians keep their promises? Will they, um, will they hold fast uh, to, uh, to their conviction in Christ? Uh, or are they going to fall away and slip into uh, apostasy, giving up on Christ? Well, hopefully they held fast. Um, but unfortunately, we, we don't know uh, what their decision is going to be. But the question still remains for us. What are we going to do? And the question kind of always is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to accept him? Or are you going to, to deny him? So uh, now getting into verses 20, the really the memory verse, uh, 24 and 25. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at this. There are three ways in which faithful Christians should prevent each other from wavering becoming discouraged, or falling to temptation to return to, uh, in this case, Judaism. Uh, in our case, it could be fill in the blank, whatever whatever is that draws people away from, from God. So number one is considering one another. Number two is by stirring up. Literally means to spur on one another, uh, to love and good works. And number three, by faithfully assembling or meeting with the saints. The word forsake, uh, that is neglecting, means to abandon, um, not, to, not to miss. And so, 
Now, it's my personal belief that the church doesn't really understand the verse. Um, at the very least, it's really hyper fixated on the assembling component. I think often we are quick to point out failed attendance. We never consider the other two components on why our brothers and sisters may not be assembling with us. And so um, I believe that we will be held in some, to some degree um, for those who willingly, as this verse implies, fail to meet with us. It's a choice. We're not talking about being sick. We're not talking about missing every once in a while. Those who do not want to meet here, we have to look inside and say, why? And that not always, it's not always us. Sometimes it's like choices that they have made. It's something that they've decided, but there is a component that we're responsible for. Um, and so um, I guess first, let's talk about our definitions. So what does it mean to stir one another up to love and good works? Encourage. Okay, so to encourage. To jab. To jab. The idea is, is uh, anybody here like Westerns? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the spur, what's the, is the spur comfortable for the horse yep. when the cowboy jumps on the horse? It's not. So sometimes there's discomfort, discomfort involved. Um, and it's interesting that it says to spur us on to love and good works. Okay. So um, what are some examples of of that, how can we encourage one another to do what type of activities? Try to get specific with it. Well, just being with them. Yeah. Just make some time, mm -hmm. and whether it's over a cup of coffee or a sandwich or a meal, mm -hmm. just talk with them, and then maybe bring up matters of faith. Yeah. Uh, sure. To encourage or let them talk to you if they have a problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes they might even just bear their soul to you. Yeah, true. Clark? Rather than being judgmental, be um, thinking of what they might be needing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Not being quick to, to judge, but looking at it from the flip side. Um, anything else? Is it is it easier do you think to stay faithful to Christ with a thankful heart or with a heart of bitterness and or woe is me? The previous. So in my, this is my opinion, I think it's easier to stay faithful to Christ when you are serving other people. And so encouraging people for love and good works is, might even be, why don't you just come with me and let's go visit someone at the home? Why don't we take some people uh, that I know that are really struggling through the loss of someone, like, I've already baked the cookies, you just want to tag along, they, it would mean a lot if, if you were there. And so um, I think service is a big part, encouraging each other to see that there's people worse off than, than us, and we've been blessed and we can help these people. It's interesting to note that one of the treatments of clinical depression is to get outside of yourself mm -hmm. and that's one way you do it sure um, by by serving others mm -hmm. um, that gives you that well we know what what happens when you do that I mean right they're they're appreciative of it but it also gives you an encouragement you probably benefit more than than they ever do from the act of kindness yeah do you have something David I don't know if it's the appropriate time but I'm gonna ask anyway okay uh, if we're looking at this situation, the meeting together yes. as our worship assembly, <clears throat> I think it's interesting what's lumped in there with it is this considering how to spur one another to love and good works. That's that's our faith in action. That's our faith applied. That's right. acts of service. Do we allow that to take place as part of our corporate worship together as a body? Right. Right. And if, if so, like how, how do we do that? It's a good Just question. throwing the question out there. I, yeah. I haven't thought past that. Um, yeah, I don't think he's, uh, I don't think that the writer here is uh, referring to letting the young man have a chance to lead the closing prayer. I don't think 
think that's what we're meaning in participation of uh, worship. This is this is something uh, I think a little deeper than that. Even um, there, there seems I in this particular instance, as we at, at the other <coughs> verses after twenty four and twenty five say that there's a time where these Christians had their possessions taken and there was persecution that they endured and so um, there definitely was a need in the church to help one another through that time because if, if the government decides tomorrow morning that they're going to come in and take your stuff um, because you were associated with a political <coughs> agenda that doesn't fit their narrative you know most of us well most of us are retired a couple of us may lose our jobs have our stuff taken we're, who else are we going to lean on besides each other at that point and so there there were opportunities to to serve here that we probably aren't going through right now um, but with that being said there still needs to be something in place that the church is is serving and and uh, allows opportunities for people to all get involved so i don't have a an exact answer to your question, but it's something we need to be thinking about how we can implement that. Did my question make sense? Do you need to ask it again? Did I? I don't know. Did I'm I sure still it? thinking about it, not neglecting the meet together. It, it seems like part of the meeting together, when I read this, should involve taking time to consider what are we going to do together. Right. That is yeah. an expression of love and good works. Right. <coughs> I just. I think that might be missing somewhat in in our game. And worship. So you're saying we don't meet together just for the sake of meeting together. Right. We, we do something with, with what we're learning and what we're right. professing. Right. No, I, I think you're right. I think also hidden underneath this, even this layer is, like, you have to have a relationship with your brothers and sisters. Um, uh, and that's that's something that I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, do we care about one another to spur on one another? Is there that deep of a relationship? I mean, do we give do we give a rat's hat about each other? Really? I mean, that's I mean, that's Dr. Ramey, my professor. That that was his favorite quote. Uh, he told us that we did not have to do a pediatric rotation because kids are like puppy dogs and they know if if you like them or not. People know if you like them or not. Um, people people know. And so at the root of it, people not choosing to come because I don't feel like they're liked. You they they you don't feel like they're cared about. They just are they just a number? You know, I've I've been to congregations where it's felt that way before. I've been on the receiving end of some comments that were particularly uh, hurtful about um, about attendance that they didn't understand everything involved and I didn't have a relationship with them and I was like why are you telling me this lady like I don't know you and it's like I think you care about me but it doesn't show otherwise and so I think we have to think about this verse and how it's been engraved I think in the church before we say anything to someone about forsaking the assembly, I think we have to ask some questions. Number one, why would we say it in a public place? I've heard it said to people in the auditorium where everyone can hear. Why would we do that? Like, that doesn't make sense. Um, go to someone in private if you really want to address it. Number two, do you have a right to? Have you fostered a relationship with this individual that is deep enough to say something brass? Odds are probably not. I mean, I and so I think those are two things that we have to ask before we say anything about someone missing on Wednesday night or a Sunday night. But again, the emphasis of this verse is not that. It is people who have turned their backs on God and abandoned Christ. Um, and so that's really the main emphasis. But besides that, it is something we need to be vigilant of our, why people aren't coming. Is it because of something internal in the church that's happening that 
they don't want to be here or is it something they're struggling with and so again that comes back down to relationships we have to build relationships with each other and we have to foster an environment that allows people to be open about what's going on and so I know that I'm on a soapbox this, this morning, and uh, I apologize for that, yes. And we don't need to be blunt about it. Exactly. Um, you know, yeah. when we stopped going to the congregation in Philly, we had one elder reach out to us, mm -hmm. and he was, like you said, had a relationship with us, mm -hmm. knew us well enough that he could come to us. Mm -hmm. But he didn't come to us and say, why aren't you coming to church? Right. You know, it, his comment was, is everything okay? Is there something I can do for you? Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't mm -hmm. like, you know, you need to come back to church. Where have you been? Yeah. You know, you don't have to be blunt about it. Right. And put it across as, mm -hmm. I care about you and, right. you know, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I've, I've heard it brassly said to people in the auditorium with people around and that is a great way for that person to never darken the doors of the building again so yeah. yes we can't be more prioritized or focused on the person being in the pew than we are about the actual person right just because right. they're in the seat doesn't mean that their life's put together they, they right. could be present but not present yeah. and so yeah. we've done the, the groundwork to invest in their lives and know them and care about them they won't be more than just a number mm -hmm. right and that's not what we want to have right there was a, a question posed oh maybe a year or two ago and the question was uh, does self is salvation based on church attendance You really want to go fishing with that, uh, because this is, and, and it was actually, it was from this passage. So, are you going to be judged by how many church services you went to versus how many you missed? Now, the, I think the focus is abandonment. Right. That's the focus. That's the focus of this passage. Uh, but, and, and that's where you you really need to maybe pay attention to because spiritually there might be something wrong. Yeah. But if you're gonna go after the go after the uh, brother or sister with this with the sword and start <laughs> chopping up on them. Uh, right. That, no, not that, good. That idea. That not idea. good. Right. Um, so I don't know if you can if you, I don't think there's a, a, a right answer for that question because now you're the judge. Right. So. <laughs> now, the, the, on the flip side, I'm not saying, like, don't reach out to people. Please check up on people. Like, check do it them. kindly. Like, we really... Send them flowers. <laughs> bring I'll, bring I'll remember that next time you're not here. Bring the bowl of chili. Bring the bowl of chili. What's your favorite flower, Jim? <laughs> Wow. Was that set? No. Who no. was it? Was it Sarah? Did you say it? It was set. That was it. Yes. Okay. Yes, Kate. We can talk about all of this, and I agree with all of this, but there's also a component of that that if you have a relationship with that person, maybe you could get through to them how discouraging it is to you personally. Yeah. that they're not coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's part of it, too. I mean, people need to realize mm -hmm. that when they're not there and you have a relationship and you miss them, mm -hmm. that's discouraging to you. Yeah, and that's, that's, uh, that's where uh, sometimes discouragement within, within the church is from missing somebody at worship. Uh, sure. They didn't feel it was important enough now and I'm just a side note as, as I was coming in this morning I passed the ball fields I don't understand and then how many of those folks that are out there and I'm not talking kids I'm talking the adults that took their child there where's their focus 
in, in the back of my mind, it says that sport is more important than the Lord himself. Unless they went to Mass on Saturday night. <laughs> but no, I, that's, that's where my focus is. And then growing up, growing up, we never saw that. As kids, we never saw that on Sunday. Sunday afternoon, yes. Sunday morning, definitely not. You know what also happens, it's really tough about that. And Sarah, I know you'll agree with this too. Kids are really under pressure to show up sure. for those things and punished if they're not. Yeah. And that really puts parents, I'm sorry, between a rock and a hard place, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, to that point, before I forget, I think that's also important why we take time to consider when, when situations like that arise where, you know, you only have so many hours in the week, your kids are punished if you don't go do this thing that we <coughs> Take time outside of the assembly to to fellowship and yeah. be together and right, yeah. right. Yeah. Does stuff like that happen? Yeah. 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 I've said to people before, I missed you. Yeah. And they'll start giving me some reasons, and I stop it right there and I tell them, I missed you. You don't have to give me excuses. I just fly a mystery. I'm going to say it. Yes, Mike. You know, I ran into a guy that used to go here. Mm -hmm. So I've been here for 46 years. And he stopped coming two years after I got here. So there are some people here who know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to tell you who he is. His family went here. They all went here. Some of his family still attend here at times, and he hasn't been here for 44 years. And he stopped by my house, and I didn't recognize him. We changed in 44 years. I mean, come on. You know, I didn't recognize him. And he kind of got upset at first. What do you mean you don't know me? This kind of thing. And we got to talking a little bit, and he said something about forsaking. You know, because he knows scripture pretty good. His family. Mm -hmm. If you knew who I was talking about. <coughs> and I told him, I said, first of all, forsaking the assembly is a small part of what's going on. Yeah. I said, you deserted the Lord first, and then you stopped coming to you know, the service. I said, the church, the family is still there, and you're welcome anytime. Uh, you know, and I know some of the things that happened over the last 44 years you know, are not good. And he's alone. And you know, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start going. And then he started talking about some of the people. You know, and it wasn't good. And he was like, is that guy still there? No, he's been dead for 30 years. <laughs> you know, and he, and he, he was holding on to something negative, and the first thing I told him was, I don't want to hear, like Terry said, I don't really care all you've done. You deserted the Lord first, and that's where you've got to come back there first. And, you know, and he still has, <laughs> and, you know, he's, he's very, he's very volatile. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think from a medical background, if you look at it this way, it's <clears throat> not Coming is probably a symptom of uh, a bigger issue. Uh, something more sinister is probably happening. Um, In this case, that's, that's definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. And so, what's our responsibility? According according to Hebrews 10, 23, 24, 25 here, what's our responsibility? To spur them on. Consider. To consider. consider. To spur. Yeah. So... Um, and don't stop. And and don't stop. Yeah, don't take right. don't take a negative responses. Right. Well, it's you know the other the other one of the instructions is uh, in a spiritual manner with love, mm -hmm. unless you yourself get caught up in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have to consider that. And somebody said all the church is is a support system. Yeah, it is. And uh, uh, it's a hospital for sinners. Yeah, 
Mm -hmm. Are you one? Maybe you need to get to the hospital. <laughs> you know, go, <laughs> just let them talk. But but it's it's about relationships, right? And if you if you go up and said, uh, "Where were you? I missed you." Well, that didn't go off too good. No, you you, you probably started it, off that. They put them on the defensive. Exactly. It all depends on who, who the person is and how well you know them and, and your exactly. relationship. You can do that to some people. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can. Yeah, if Fritz did it to me, I'd say, I went fishing. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, but you went fishing for the wrong person. <laughs> that's, that's how that works. Uh, that's how that works. That's how that works. So, I, I think the point can be boiled down to... <laughs> If the church does not have personal one-on-one -on -one relationships with each other and between her members, it will die. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing it all over the country. Um, even in large congregations where they, their contribution, they can support who knows what number of works all over the place. There's over 500 people every Sunday whatever they can be dead inside there's no fellowship there's there's nothing going on you can be spiritually dead and still still functioning as as a almost a business conglomerate i mean uh, uh, uh like what in revelation uh what was what was the church's problem where christ wanted to spew them out of his mouth warm. they were lukewarm they weren't on fire for christ yeah. um and so a church without that relationship aspect, that fellowship aspect, the considering the spurring on one another, um, I think will lead to spiritual death and eventually probably close its doors in the community and, and cease to be. Yes. I have a question. Uh -huh. um, from the beginning of time, people have worshipped collectively mm -hmm. to worship God. Mm -hmm. I know there's more than one reason than just to spoil one another of good works. What about worshiping God? And it's not to go and be entertained. It's right. to go and worship God collectively as a group because that's what He wants. Mm -hmm. So there, it's a, it's more than one reason mm -hmm. sure. as to mm -hmm. why we worship on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We forget that sometimes. <coughs> You have no idea how much of an encouragement you could be to a brother or sister just by being there. Yeah. 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 So you have no idea. So your responsibility is not only to worship God, but you're going to be an encouragement to that brother or sister. I would say it would be pretty hollow to worship with the saints and not have a relationship with anybody, though. And be called together as God's people, and it's like, I don't know y'all. You don't know me. It's like, I'm here to worship God together as He wants us to do. But if there's no bond, what are we at that point? Are we the bride of Christ, or are we just, uh, I mean, it, I think that goes back to loving God. If you love God, you love each other. I mean, that's the. That's the point of Second Corinthians 13, is it not? It's not for marriages. That's for us. That's in our, in our uh, Christianity. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have. Well, part of the fellowship is, one, getting to know your brother or sister. Right. Sharing interests, hobbies, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, sharing uh, maybe life's battles mm -hmm. that you're having. Then that person might have some knowledge on how to handle that situation. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I mean, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do it? Right. And I would say too, as far as um, coming to worship on the first day of the week, remembering Christ's sacrifice is a God-given commandment. It's something we're supposed to do. Um, but I would say that there's more to it than that. Um, if you look at the opening letters from Paul, uh, the way that he talks to those congregations is very 
personal, there's work being done. Mm -hmm. There is more than just we show up, we worship, we go home. There is a fellowship and a bond in those congregations. Uh, you, you can tell from the letter that there is one-on-one, -on -one, we are striving together to get to the goal. And so um, I don't think you can separate the two. You, you just can't. Um, they, they go hand in hand for it to, to function as it should. So um, that's, that's my spiel on verses 24 and 25. Because <laughs> I, 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 like I said, I've been on the receiving end of some comments that were probably not thought out very well. And uh, I, I've heard it, unfortunately, said in congregations that I was like, I'd be surprised if those individuals come back. And I have heard this quoted and probably misused in sermons and different things throughout my years. And, and so it's something that I, I think that we just don't quite get and spend enough time considering the whole passage the context of the passage. That's why whenever we take verses that we've taken all these years and spit them out, we need to go back and, and really get the context of what is this writer, who are they talking to, what are they trying to emphasize before we use scripture. So uh, that's something that I think is important for us to constantly reevaluate and make sure that we know what we're talking about. So Yeah, that point is the what, what we're discussing has been brought up before. Mm -hmm. You're misusing that scripture. Yeah. You're, you're taking it out of text. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just a way of you bashing a brother or sister. Right. That's not what you're supposed to do. Right. Yeah. Bashing is definitely opposite of encouraging. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything else before we wrap this up? <laughs> this part? I'm looking forward to Wednesday's recap. I'm, I, or, I, I can't wait. That one, right? no. <laughs> Another perspective of, of it, I guess. Um, so, what does the day mean in this passage? Well, the truth is, we just don't really know. Um, there are some. There's uh, three or four um, possibilities that it could be. Um, I would say I have my own opinion. You may have yours, but. Um, the King James Version does not capitalize the word. In my ESV, it is capitalized, so take that for what it's worth. Now, it could mean the Lord's Day, Sunday, where we come together and remember uh, Christ's um, sacrifice for us. Uh, it could be the day of trial or persecution. This would fit better uh, if the destination of this letter uh, is to, to Rome. It could refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. This would fit if the, if the destination of this letter is to Jerusalem. It could be the day of the Lord, referring to the visitation of the Lord, a judgment of the Lord, uh, the second coming. Uh, Westcott, Lightfoot, most of the other commentators seem to favor this view. And I, I also tend to, to, to favor this view as well. Um, Regardless of the meaning, the emphasis still remains and holds true for Christians today. And so, um, uh, I think that's probably a good stopping point for today. Is there any other comments before we wrap up this section? I always thought it was Sunday or the day of worship. Could be. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I always, I always thought it was a Sunday. The, uh, it's interesting that the second coming is always spoken as coming soon, though. So, who knows? Yeah. God's timeline is not man's timeline. That's right. That's right. So, regardless, uh, it's important that we practice the things discussed in these, these verses.